But what, what can we do to, make, to ameliorate our situation? Well, I have always been an optimist. I'm more optimistic right now than I have been for a long time. Because sometimes when you're an optimist, you're an optimist simply on principle. You believe it's going to turn out all right, but you don't see how it possibly could. I'm beginning to see how it possibly could turn out all right. And uh, my notion is, first of all, I, I follow in my thinking about shamanism and I follow the great historian of religion, Merci Eliad, who got it almost all right, except that he never embraced psychedelics. He thought they were decadent, but that was just his French European education, and he came too early. But anyway, Eliade wrote a book called Shamanism, and then he subtitled it, The Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. Now, he wrote the book in French. In French, technique has a connotation that it doesn't have in English. It means both a way to do things, and it means technology. Later, the French sociologist Jacques Ellul wrote a book called Propaganda. And the little banner under which his book flew, which is printed right on the frontispiece, is he says, there are no political solutions, only technological ones. The rest is propaganda. And then he spends 200 pages explaining what he means by political solutions, technological solutions, and propaganda. By Ellul's understanding, I agree. I think ideology is toxic. All ideology. It's not that there are good ones and bad ones. All ideology is toxic. Because ideology is a kind of insult to the gift of human free thinking. I mean, if you adopt some ideology, Leninism, Mormonism, it doesn't matter, then you have all the answers. You just go and look in the catechism. Well, I don't know why they issued you a brain. They could have just given you the catechism. Uh, technology, as the counterpoint to uh, ideology, is a very different animal. Now, right now, we're going through a technophobic phase because people think technology means exploding nuclear power plants and uh, you know, irradiated food and t TV. But all technology really means, in the McLuhan sense, is the extensions of man. The extensions of man. And so language is a technology. Shamanism is a technology. Psilocybin is a technology. And certainly the internet <coughs> is a technology. I do not think that uh, the government, under the guise of some phony, alarmist, pseudoscientific rhetoric, should attempt to control the evolution of consciousness. After all, if these things truly are consciousness expanding, it doesn't take too much intelligence to realize that it is the absence of consciousness that is causing our flirtation with extinction and planetary disaster. If there is any way to raise consciousness, diet, drug, machine, sexual practice, mantra, yantra, whatever it is, we should be furiously exploring and applying it. Because if we should fumble the ball, if we should actually, uh, where our ancestors over thousands of generations did not fail, if we are to fail, the magnitude of the tragedy will be immense. Because failure is not inevitable. It is not inevitable that we should fail. There are ideas, personalities, technologies, uh, available right now, which, if honestly explored and, and implemented, could 
rescue the human enterprise from the disgrace that hovers over us. We don't want this to end in a toxified garbage pit ruled by Nazis, which is, you know, the way we may well be headed. Ignorance is no longer an excuse. Anthropology in the last hundred years has laid at our doorstep the tools necessary for an archaic reconstruction of uh, society and uh, human values within that society. It's inconceivable that Western industrial capitalism could run on another 500 or 1,000 years. Uh, it, it will not continue as it has. It will deteriorate under the pressure of resource scarcity. And what few democratic values we have obtained, what little space for reasoned discourse has been created, will be the first to be swept away. So it's, it's very, very important that people take back their minds and that people analyze our dilemma in the context of the entire human story, from the descent onto the grassland to our potential destiny as citizens of the galaxy and the universe. We are at a critical turning point. And as I say, the tools, the, the data that is, holds the potential for our salvation is now known. It is available. It is among us but it is misrepresented, it is slandered, it is litigated against, and uh, it's up to each one of us to relate to this situation in a fashion that will allow us to answer the question that will surely be put to us in some point in the future, which is, what did you do to help save the world? And, and so, my point is, and I make it in a forum like this, because here we have so much permission for belief. I mean, you want to believe in, you know, channeling from beyond the grave? Fine, no problem. You want to believe in the healing power of nematodes, hematodes, hematite, you name it. We've got it all. Uh, really, I think that uh, the spirit of... Uh, Childlike, untrammeled curiosity is what we're striving for. Not the anal retentive, uh, rational person. Not the all go for anything channeling flake. But an attitude of we don't have to look far for miracles because they're all around us. Everything is astonishing. The universe on its surface is alive with mystery. Well, how do we make our way toward that? When we live in a culture, practice a language, embody a philosophy, scientific rationalism, which is entirely designed to suck wonder out of reality, to turn everything into shades of gray, to uh, uh, subvert all hope that lies outside the realm of career accomplishment and material possession. Well, the way that we can overcome this is through a personal um, acting out of what I have been calling now for several years the archaic revival. And I want to talk about that a little bit this evening because I think it, it you know, however much we may kid around about the new age, uh, it is an important aspect of what is going on. Its triviality is rooted in the side of it which is ungrounded, ephemeral, and uh, self-promoting. But it springs from a fairly profound and deep sense that things are not all right in this society. 
uh, I think that I first encountered the phrase New Age in the writings of Helen Petrovna Blavatsky. She wrote in the 20s. I read her in the 50s. Uh, the New Age has been with us for a long time, so long that there's nothing new about it. And in fact, the reason I call it the Archaic Revival is because I think we can understand this movement if instead of accentuating what about it that is new, novel, and never before seen, instead we emphasize that this is a profoundly conservative impulse. A, a, a conservative impulse that would set the hair of George Bush and his skull and bones buddies standing on end. Because when we talk about conservative, we're not talking about returning to the era of Eisenhower. We're talking about returning to the era of Isis, Asarte, uh, the great horned goddess of the high Paleolithic. In other words, uh, this program of material civilization exteriorization of ideas into matter through first alchemy and magic and then science and industry, this process is coming to an end one way or another. We are either going to plant ourselves and most of the rest of the life on this planet by blindly pursuing this cultural model until we run it right over the edge into the apocalypse or from the genes, from the bones, from the oceans, from the forests, from the glaciers, there is going to have to come a turning point, a change, a revulsion so profound that it allows us by the tens of millions to change how we think about reality, to change how we live. Only in the last 6,000 years on the European continent and those civilizations that are the children of Europe has there been any other approach to these problems. Well, and, and what the other approach, linear thought, the phonetic alphabet, science, mathematical abstraction, so forth and so on, what these other approaches have brought us is uh, toxicity, pollution, mutation, catastrophe, revolution, death, and yes, friends, even unhappiness. <laughs> it hasn't worked. Western civilization is now crowing over the fact that the only opposition it ever had, which was Marxism, a pathetic weak sister, has now collapsed upon itself. Well, there should be no congratulation in that because the contradictions which undid Marxism lie in wait to undo this society as well. Both societies are materialistic. <laughs> Both societies define human beings and treat them as things. And the fact of the matter is Western civilization at this moment is a loaded gun pointed at the head of this planet. And we, for all our pretensions to uh, a sensitivity to the presence of vitamin C or zinc in our diet or all the rest of this malarkey, we are the major uh, preva uh, prevaricators of this situation. So a certain um, obligation rests upon us. And I think we're meeting this obligation. Uh, I wouldn't say we're doing a great job or a terrible job. I think we're functioning uh, at approximately a B plus level. The future is mental. Figure it out. If the mind does not loom large in the future history of this species, then what the hell kind of future is it going to be? I mean, this is our crowning glory. 
our uh, aesthetic sensitivities, our ability to create values that are not simply uh, based on the next meal, the next sexual encounter, the next uh, empowering social move, but an ability to create social values based on uh, creating a viable future environment for children, uh, creating a, a viable present environment for the less fortunate among us, uh, creating a, a social safety net so that the, mo the more maladaptive of us are not uh, reduced to living under bridges and in abandoned automobiles. I mean, these are the things which set us above the apes. These are the things which take us out of the context of organic nature and make it seem as though, hey, there actually are some transcendental values being maximized here. There actually is something going on in, within the human family that if it were to be lost, fumbled away, compromised, or destroyed, the universe would be a poorer place for it. Truly a poorer place for it. And I think, uh, I think we take our humanness too much for granted. I don't think we realize uh, how nasty, brutish, and short most of life has been over the centuries and how really only in the, within the confines of the 20th century has uh, a level of uh, comfort and food availability and shelter and uh, basic creature needs been met to the point where most people can begin to lead the philosophical life that previously was uh, the privilege of emperors kings, great courts. Now we all indulge ourselves. We all have the philosopher king's point of view. We all uh, have a model of history, a model of the future. And we all uh, feel capable of stepping into the shoes of our leaders and discharging that responsibility. Well, in order to do that, I think we need to overcome our amnesia about how we got to this place. I don't see, you see what science would have you believe and explicitly implies is that we are an aberration. Here over here you have nature, the beautiful rainforests, the wonderful coral reefs, the symmetry of the hummingbird, the sea urchin, and the butterfly. And here you have us, grimy, tawdry, polluting, ugly, driven, in, equilibri in disequilibrium, in denial. I don't believe that. I believe that this kind of thinking that breaks humanity away from the rest of nature is the first of the great disempowering myths by which the Western mind has enslaved itself. And we are not outside of nature. We are not a runaway, toxic process. We are not a mutation. We are, in fact, that part of nature which has been deputized for a purpose. We are the energy gathering aspect of the Gaian mind. We are the language forming capacity of nature herself. Is Gaia, as it were, awake on the side that's in the sunlight and in the side that's in the darkness as it rotates, dreaming? At night are the plants, the animals, the, the whole ecosystems, the oceans, in some sense, in the dream state when dreams and spontaneous images of what might be possible uh, come to them. So is there a kind of Gaian dreaming and does it happen on the night side of the planet? 
what would the Gaian mind feel like? What, what form would a Gaian dream take? Or what form would a Gaian psychedelic experience take? The psychedelic experience, it's preposterous to attempt to analyze it in terms of human motivation at its intense levels. It seems rather to be an ontological reality of its own that the human being has simply privil been privileged to briefly observe but it says no more your psychedelic ex your deep psychedelic experiences say no more about your personality than that the continent of africa is making a statement about your personality they are in fact independent uh, objects uh, to my mind the divine imagination or the imagination is this the source of all creativity in our dreams, in our psychedelic experiences, in the jungles, in the currents of the ocean, in the organization of protozoan and microbial life. Wherever there is large-scale integration, rather than simply raw physics, but integration of laws of physics, integration of properties of membranes and electrophoresis and this sort of thing, it is the creative principle. So do you think then that in psychedelic experiences you're actually tapping into, tuning into, or experiencing something of the Gaian or the cosmic imagination? Absolutely. And I think that, it, that psychedelic experiences and dreams are only different in degree, that they are chemical cousins somehow. And this is why I could see human history as a guy in dream, because I think every night when you descend into dream, you are potentially open to receiving guy in corrective tuning of your life state. You will, the, the whole thing is an enzyme-driven process. We are like an organ of Gaia. We are the uh, organ which binds and releases energy. For reason, I mean, a liver cell doesn't need to understand why it binds and releases enzymes of the liver. We bind and release energy for reasons perhaps never to be clear to us, but which place us firmly within the context of, uh, of the guy in mind. We have been chosen out. And this is not something to have great hubris about. I mean, indolacetic acid has been chosen out in plant metabolism to play certain roles. We have a role, but our role seems to be a major one. We are like a triggering system out of the general background of evolutionary processes mediated by incoming radiation to the surface of the earth and then natural selection, suddenly we come with an epigenetic capability. We write books, tell stories, dance, sing, carve, paint. These are not genetic processes. These are epigenetic processes. And they bind information and express the guy in mind uh, very well as an example of how willing I am to introduce or to entertain this idea concretely, I've been talking to a lot of people about ecological crisis and the fate of the world and this sort of thing. Well, imagine in hindsight the wisdom that we would impute to Gaia if we were to suddenly realize that what is happening on this planet is that nature knows that the sun is going to explode. And what we are is a kind of response to the anticipation of a wounding that 50,000, 5 million years ago, the geo-heliocentric relationships began to vibrate out of tune. And, um, as a consequence of this, a species was called forth that could organize an escape. And we are it. In other words, we are in a divine play. In line with this, and what made me even entertain these ideas, is I had a very bizarre experience recently. I was in Hawaii, and uh, 
in our botanical garden there is a very large dead tree and one limb of this tree sticks far out over the over the land and uh, Banisteriopsis capi, a large hallucinogenic South American vine, is planted at the, at the bottom of this tree. And uh, it just has swarmed up this tree and covered it with greenery. But it wouldn't go out onto this one limb that stuck out. And I, it bothered my sense of symmetry that this vine would not completely cover this tree. And I even thought about trying to climb up into the tree and thread it out onto this limb to get it to do what I wanted. So I was sitting looking at this tree and this situation and actually thinking about it. And suddenly the limb fell. <laughs> it broke off. And then I thought, and I thought, the vine sensed that it was in unstable. It would not invade this domain that it sensed was structurally unstable. Well, then I said to myself, but how could it? What is the mechanism of this sensing of instability? And a, a friend of mine said, well, perhaps the wind impacts on weakened wood differently than on unrotted wood and perhaps rhythms in the tree tell it to stay away from it. And then I realized if one plant has that kind of sensitivity to the entering into a domain of danger, what must the ecosystem of this planet be doing in reaction to what we are doing to the planet? So it, I, I see, uh, the reason this relates to the imagination is because I see uh, ourselves in communication <laughs> with the imagination. It is sending images back into the past to try and direct us away from areas of instability. It really is the Gaian mind is a real mind. Its messages are real messages. And our task through discipline, psychedelics, attention to detail, whatever we have going, is to try and extract this message and eliminate ourselves from the message so that we then can see the face of the other.